work the talk the podcast where we delve into the dynamics of workplace evolution and innovation i'm thrilled to have you join us today for a conversation that's close to our hearts the future of workforces and workplaces i'm your host asta and today we have an awesome guest joining us Nancy Zakaria is a professional certified coach and a strategic HR business partner. Nancy brings over 15 years of HR and coaching expertise crafting strategies that enhance the employee experience. Currently she's the senior talent and organizational development manager at McDermott International Limited. Nancy is an absolute powerhouse. She has been gracing the stage at large scale events, be it Women Leader Summit to HR Excellence Energy Summit. She's an active part of the Corporate Research Forum and a very well known female leader in the region. She's she's also featured on the cover of Style Femina Issue, and the list keeps going on and on. Nancy, welcome to Work the Talk. We're honored to have you here. We'd love to know more about your journey. Thank you so much Esther for having me. Um it's really a privilege for me to be here with you today. Wonderful. So Nancy, uh you know you have been an advocate um uh, around the female advancement in the workplace and the, and you you are really well aware of the possible blockers that that are there and this is the topic that we are they we're going to talk about today. Now despite we have seen quite a lot of progress happening around and a lot of chatter on this topic as well, but despite the progress, women still encounter unique obstacles in their careers. Now exploring these challenges not only brings awareness but also opens the doors to solution and that's exactly why we are talking about this subject today now uh, you've been a strong advocate right and uh, you you know the importance of coaching and hr policies that can support uh, the the betterment of women in the workforce for our listeners what inspired you to champion this and how did you start your journey around the subject well um first of all thank you so much um for your for your question and for um acknowledging all the obstacles that are still there so we try as much as possible but um yes there might be still uh, many obstacles and um i really strongly believe that coaching and and hr uh, as you mentioned like play pivotal roles in uh, in fostering personal growth and professional growth within individuals and within organizations um and that's what Uh, attracted me to that because when we look at the essence of of coaching the essence of coaching lies in unlocking potential in fostering resilience in uh, supporting individuals in achieving their goals and it's simply taking someone from good to great yeah and in the realm of hr as well um creating a positive environment and facilitating those communication and aligning uh, goals that will help individuals to to grow and to flourish in the environment uh, where they are so my journey uh, in in those fields began if i may put it that way it began with a genuine passion for helping people thrive in their careers and for fostering workplaces and workplace cultures that values each individual and that's that's what really attracted me and i've gone through you know before landing there i've gone through several uh, career pivots uh, prior to landing into hr and uh, and then when i was in that space i found my passion and fulfillment and really got curious about deepening my skills in that so witnessing that transformative power of coaching and the strategic impact of uh, the hr practices has you know in, inspired me to continue on this uh, journey and i have seen the power of uh, that trans transformation and the positive impact of coaching on me personally uh and that what motivated me uh to see the opportunity to contribute to success uh, uh you know to help in the success of individuals and um, and in and in organizations 
Wow. Wow. That's, that's a beautiful journey, actually. And uh, you talked about coaching. And this is something I, I want to, you know, cover a little bit in depth in the later part of this, um, you know, segment. Before that, I want to also talk about the number of events that you grace. You know, there are so many large scale events that you've been a part of and you're sharing your insights and, you know, you're networking, so on and so forth. As a female, I've seen, um, you know, of course, networking is a very important part of any any person's career, be it man or woman, right? But I see that networking comes off very easy to men. And, um, you know, whenever we go to events and specifically I belong to the tech domain and women in tech, of course, it's so celebrated because there's so so few, such few women over there, right? Yeah. And I come from the beauty background where uh, it was it was super, there was so much female energy and then suddenly coming to tech and you'd see out of out of thousand, there are like hundred women in, in a large scale event. It comes very tough for women to mingle so quickly, so easily. And specifically because I think uh, for men, it's also very easy to bond over drinks, over over smokes. And women specifically, I belong to India. It, you know, I see that there is a, a cultural um, aspect also that, that, that probably holds them back. Uh, so what are your thoughts? How, given it's a very important part of, of any career development, uh, what are your thoughts on networking and uh, what, 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 what do you think about it? Uh, and, and this is wonderful. And I'm glad that you touched on it because one of the things that I actually wanted to emphasize on is the power of building relationships in career growth. Uh, not, uh, not only the focus on technical skills, because, you know, focusing on technical skills and doing the work is going to be important, of course, to uh, build that credibility. But what is more important and sometimes overlooked is the, the, the power and the importance of uh, building relationships and where can that uh, get you and take you and um, often you mentioned that uh, you know you mentioned that maybe women don't find it easy you know to to network or or connect and uh, this is where I invite women or men but you know specifically women to look within and reflect on what are the obstacles what is stopping them from uh, taking uh, that uh, that step and why I, I'm saying that because more often that, than not we find that the main obstacles uh, that are found there are actually in the minds That's of true. women so the, the obstacle for for advancing will be the limitations that the women put for themselves or the disempowering beliefs that they have about certain things. Oh, I'm Fear not of good judgment. Enough. Oh, exactly. So they allow the inner critic within them to take that decision on their behalf. Yeah. So what they do is actually they're giving their power away to that inner critic, to that judge, and they're continuously having this negative self-talk to themselves. Oh, I'm not good enough. I can't do this. And you no, know, what if I do this and I get turned back? So there are always these assumptions. So the, the, the first thing I really invite them to do is to change the narrative, to look at what are the stories that they're telling themselves and um, change that language that they are talking to themselves with, replace it with a positive language, uh, encourage themselves. And in a nutshell, if I may use that term, I just invite them to be good mothers for their brains. Wow. Because, you know, that's powerful. That's powerful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, a good mother would encourage, would support, would believe in the power. And it's the same thing because our mind would believe anything that we tell it. So, and we are having that, if we're continuously having that negative talk, this is the impact that we're having on our brain. And that may be the main reason that's stopping us from, from doing that. But once also they understand the power, some of them might think, yeah, well, networking is just a waste of time. Perhaps, you know, I don't have time for this. I need to finish my work. But actually, it is an essential part of growing personally and professionally as a person and uh, connecting with uh, with people. And sometimes without having, uh, 
um, I mean, like some of them might feel like, yeah, I don't want to connect with people. And they feel, you know, I'm just connecting because I want something from them. It's not that. It's just connecting for the sake of connecting, of being curious, of learning from each other, um, of sharing knowledge and experiences. And then you'll never know where, where this is, mm -hmm. is going to take you. But I'm, I'm going to tell you women. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. Carry on. I have a point. I mean, what, what you said, I, I want to just... Yeah. Yeah. So you, you specifically, you mentioned that, you know, they say that it's not important for them, Sim probably because there is no such tangible immediate result that they get out of networking. Do you think guilt plays a role over here? Because they're not seeing an immediate res result in their work, they feel it's not important enough or they're wasting time because they won't be able to spend that time with their family or their child or their mother. Uh, what role do you think guilt plays uh, in in this entire aspect? Um, there is uh, there is surely a role uh, a role that uh, that it plays and there is surely something maybe a saboteur and each one would think of it differently so each one might look at it differently some of them might have that perspective of of guilt some of them might um, have the perspective like no I'm not good enough to connect with them or there might be a saboteur playing there in them like if I don't always produce results and add value people will not respect me and if I'm just yeah you know not producing or providing any value i'm not able to keep up so there might be some of these saboteurs that or ways that we are sabotaging ourselves through that um, will limit our uh, potential from doing something out of the norm or out of our comfort zone some of the individuals you know networking is like their heart and soul like they you know they 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 have to have that to feel yeah. uh, energized to feel fulfilled and some of them it might not come naturally to them but that does not mean that they cannot do it but they have to be intentional about it because it is a really key part you know and and in some workplaces, what I see how women and sometimes men, you know, look at work is that, yeah, you know, that all thinking my work will speak for itself. Yeah. You know, I will just do a good work. They will be able to see it and then I'll get rewarded. I'll get that promotion. So they have that high school mentality, high, high school student mentality, like I'll do my homework and the teacher will grade it and I will get a good grade that I deserve. But actually, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. So if you don't put yourself out there, if you don't let others know what you're doing, if you don't connect with people, yeah, and the people around or the management around does not know you, even though you're doing a great job, they they wouldn't know about it. They can't advocate for uh, for what you're doing. So. Um, and, you know, recently I've been in several meetings and we are discussing, let's say, um, high potentials or people who are capable to grow in their careers. And one of the main things that managers and leaders bring up is that, well, I don't know that person. He never he never comes to me or says hi or I've seen him once in the entire year. I don't know, like the the value of the work that, that he's doing. or So this is a key thing that leaders look for when we're looking at um, how people can grow in organizations. What is the impact that they have? What is the, the personality and the presence that they bring? So it is not only doing the work and others will see it. It's no, how do I present yeah. myself in a, in a good way? That uh, So networking is key and building those relationships is really key for growth. It's very interesting. So you just mentioned that being seen is very important. Uh, then COVID happened. Everything, you know, the entire uh, dynamic of workspaces shifted and people started working from home. Uh, with your experience, how has it impacted women? Given, of course, being seen, the opportunities became even lesser. So uh, how has it impacted? What are the trends now? What do you suggest the... Uh, you know the workforce now just just you know I would like to hear your thoughts on that and and that is a very valid uh, valid point and if someone does not uh, intentionally create 
that connection point, it probably won't happen because during COVID, there was a very limited chance that you'll meet someone in the yeah. pantry or at the water cooler. So these opportunities were, were not there to connect and they had to be created. And uh, for for people, so they had to find that way to, to reach out. We have teams, we have Zooms, we have uh, uh, also lots of team members uh, very dispersed working in different locations and it's important for them to stay connected. So finding those ways and during COVID, I'll give you some examples of what we've done to stay connected. And it's all about proactivity. If you don't, if you are not proactive and take the chance and say, I actually want to connect with that person, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So again, it is about you putting yourself out there and being intentional about what you want to do. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. And during COVID, we encouraged a lot, and that was happening, a lot of um, team huddle meetings. we we'll just have a meeting for the sake of a meeting, just Talk about how you're feeling, what's going on, not about progress, not about anything. So that increased a lot during that period, just team huddles. We had virtual coffees. So we tried to, to help out. So we tried to organize virtual coffee meetings with leaders. So to try to keep the employees connected with the leaders, but we also encourage employees to connect and the managers to connect with each other and their teams in a similar manner, to ping each other on teams, to create that connection moment, to check on each other. So this is what I suggest. That's 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 great. So um, you, you have an immense experience in coaching and as you had said, and you know, it's evident from your journey that you've been deeply committed to empowering women in the workplace. So have you ever observed the impact of mentorship and sponsorship on female career progression? Um, how can these support systems be strengthened within corporate cultures? Uh, could you give us some pro tips? Because um, again, as I said, having a deep bond with a co-worker uh, and a senior co-worker getting getting the kind of sponsorship and support that you need or mentorship that you need it's very rare um as i've seen it uh so would like to know more from you yeah and i have if i look at um, at uh, my journey and my experience i have proactively sought mentorship uh, and learned a lot from all the mentors along the way. So when I, um, even if I was in organizations where at that time, perhaps we still didn't have a formal mentoring program, I tried to initiate that connection and always find a mentor, whether inside the organization or outside the organization. And this has been really instrumental in shaping my leadership style and in helping me navigating the complexities of any role that that uh, that I was in and at the moment i i ensure that mentoring is a key element of every leadership development program that i create due to the benefits that it has when we look at it it is essential that a person feels that they are having this tailored and individualized support yeah. during their growth journey. So mentors, again, if we look at um, the importance of networking and building relationships, mentors can open doors and they can be the best advocates of their mentees. True. So I really encourage um women in particular in general to use mentoring relationships to gain more insights about the business they are in to establish connections with various stakeholders to showcase their work and talents it's one of the avenues it's a it's a two-way street it's a two-way so you learn and you get that exposure. And if they are in organizations where they don't have a formal mentoring program yet, be proactive and take the initiative. If you if you see a leader that you like the way they approach things, they like the way they conduct themselves, they are like a role model, approach them and ask if they can be your mentor and ask for specific things that you'd like to be mentored on. 
Yeah. So, uh, so this is, and, and I have seen, and we do now in the organization, we do have a formal mentoring program. And as I said, I make it a point that mentoring is one of the elements of um, every leadership development program that we have due to the you know, immense impact that it can have on individuals and not on individuals. I also encourage women to mentor others. So, because when you are a mentor and um, I was, um, I was mentoring a um, couple of individuals last year uh, in the organization that is apart from the coaching, it, it was part of the mentoring program. And there was an immense benefit to me as well, because when you look at it, you can learn a lot from the mentees, from the way they look at things from, so look at it as a, as a two way learning. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot to gain, whether you're a mentor or a mentee. Interesting. So you definitely have been a part for very many um, impactful programs. Um, uh, you know, one such program is definitely around um, employee experience, which most companies have. Uh, but but the correlation is not yet made. Uh, in your eyes, have you seen a tangible relation between uh, employee engagement and profitability of a company? I've I've personally found myself engaged in similar discussions with many CHROs of different leading companies. And I'm curious to just delve deeper into this fact on your insights on this matter. Have you come across specific strategies or examples where enhancing employee experience directly contributed to the measurable impact of the company's bottom line? And we get asked this, <laughs> this uh, many times. And sometimes you can find immediately the tangible uh, numbers. And uh, sometimes it's that intangible connection that, that you find that the employees will have towards the organization. But I was recently engaged in a panel discussion on, uh, on that. And we were talking and I was checking lots of the research around it. And there were studies that have shown that highly engaged um, employees can even be up to 21% more productive than disengaged employees. And that was by a, a Gallup study. Yeah. So um, although, you know, we might think, and if we take it in a very simple form, if you are liking what you're doing, if you're comfortable, you're going to put your everything in it. You're going to put your whole self, your whole soul and heart in it. But if you're not, you're not going to do that. And eventually that is going to impact the productivity and the quality of what you do. So if we put it in simple in simple terms, but however, there is also research that proves that. And when we talk about employee engagement and the employee experience that, uh, that you mentioned, um, more often, like we look at employee engagement um, maybe as a goal in its in its own self, but fundamentally, employee engagement can be viewed as an outcome because it's a it's a reflection of the experience that the employees are having in the organization. Yeah, and that differentiated employee experience doesn't just stem from one thing. It's a, it's a journey and it's uh, it's about touching on all the moments that matter for employees. But then that combination of all factors that are happening together in the workplace, they impact that, that experience. There was also lots of other studies showing the impact of the engagement on um, productivity. And there was a recent uh, research by uh, Concentric that points out that a consistent uh, employee experience results in two times higher ratings of financial performance. So this is also based on research. It's uh, not only to say, yeah, well, automatically this will happen, but there was many companies, there were many companies that did uh, research on it and came up with, uh, with that. But an important thing here is that the employee experience uh, really needs to be aligned to the strategy and the culture of the organization to drive that business impact. Yeah, yeah. So I have I have a slightly deeper question on employee experience itself. I've seen a lot yeah. of companies club workplace experience under employee experience because, of course, it is it is the way the workplace is operating and the the brand image that the workplace is uh, suggestive of and the culture or not, whether it's imbibing or not. 
but within workplaces a lot of different uh, teams come into picture there is admin there is facility there is uh, security there is hr there is it as well with a lot of technology coming into place how does the boardroom conversation around say a great employee experience translate to uh, every team getting its own mandate uh, you have you know you you are in a large organization uh, what what has been your experience in that and specifically post covid these conversations have amped up so uh, what what has been your journey so just to, uh, to to clarify on your question, so you're saying because we have different groups in the workplace, so how can we ensure that all the groups, like we're touching on what matters for all the groups, is that or yeah, was so, it something so, else? So the question is essentially that uh, the workplace experience is essentially the yeah. experience within the corporate facility, right? An okay. employee experience is actually an experience which is probably even sitting at home, the tech they're using, when they're coming to the office, what experience they're getting, are they getting on-demand services or not, do they have, uh, say, bring your, bring your pet to office day or not. What is the kind of food they're getting, so on and so forth. So, so many other things as well as the workplace make the entire employee experience, but workplace itself is a huge part of that experience. And within that workplace to make it really future ready. And in the scenario where, uh, you know, by 20, in 2019, I think nearly 48% of the workforce was Gen Zs and millennials. By 2025, mm -hmm. that number is going to be 75%. Now, this is mm -hmm. the population that is used to Uber on demand. They're used to Netflix <laughs> or Spotify, mm -hmm. everything on demand. But when they go to the office, yeah. They have to call or they have to mail. It's so, it's still legacy. They have to, they, for every request, it is, it's a long process, right? And they have that expectation. And in COVID, they've stayed at home and they have seen, uh, you know, what, what being, uh, what working and being at home feels like. Yeah. It's, everybody remembers you. They know your references. They know the kind of coffee you have. So with that change, workplace experience itself is becoming very big. And there, a lot of teams have to probably cohesively work. But the boardroom conversation will still be probably with the with the HR teams itself because it is still clubbed under employee experience. So how does that translate? Because the mandate might be that, okay, we want our, our, our employee experience to be new age, but then the translation would be through multiple teams and that cohesion yeah. needs to come in so what has been your journey or you've been interacting with so many people mm -hmm. what has been their journey mm -hmm. what are your thoughts mm -hmm. on it so um, what i would say here is, say here is um uh, exactly right as you said so sometimes those conversations stay in that room and are owned and are looked at as they are owned by hr oh this is an an hr uh, thing that they have to to deal with. Uh, the way we look at it is that every leader has the ownership of creating that experience. It is not HR. HR come in to support, maybe through some of the policies or uh, reviewing and tailoring the, the policies to the needs of the people. And this is what we have done recently. So we have done our employee engagement survey. We have connected with individuals, tried to understand what matters for most of them and try to tailor as much as possible along those moments that matter for the employees to achieve, to, to, to help them feel, because at the end, what is it? It's a feeling, how the employee feels about it, how they feel, have they been supported? Are their needs met? Are they engaged, motivated? Is the environment nurturing for them? So it's a combination. And for everything to work, the environment is a key. So it needs the right soil to grow. And we work a lot. So what we do is we work a lot on leadership development to ensure that the leaders are modeling the right behaviors and creating that inclusive culture by having open discussions with their teams, understanding their needs and trying you know, to address them as much as possible. Tailoring is a key part, understanding the different groups, the needs of the different groups. Tailoring can be done in certain areas, for example, in the recognition and the, the benefits. Um, in flexible working, we are definitely going 
and uh, checking you know what is what is the need there yeah. and looking at um, creating that uh, culture of trust where the employee feel that they are enabled and empowered and where results when we look at it we don't look at the input we look at the output and this is creating and fostering that feeling of of uh, trust and comfort uh, and when the employee is comfortable and feel that they are trusted they can give more yeah very interesting so now I, it's a very clear demarcation of what employee experience and what uh, workplace experience means and i think uh, keeping anything being under the other is muting the power of uh, of the yeah. other right yeah so that's that's my take back now, considering the the intersectionality of uh, gender with other aspects like ethnicity, how can mm-hmm. organizations ensure a more inclusive approach to leadership development that caters to diverse backgrounds and experiences? Mm-hmm. You just talked about, you know, coaching the leaders. So what role does that play um, in this aspect? Um, there are many things. Again, uh, in that, uh, there is the preparation of the leaders by educating the leaders of the importance of diversity and not only that, by how to create that inclusive culture. Uh, Some basic things can be done around uh, education on unconscious bias and sometimes how this unconscious bias impacts the way we look at things or uh, make decisions or look at people and develop people. So this is an initial thing, is developing our uh, leadership, educating um, educating the, um, uh, the leaders. And um, another thing is by uh, merely looking, when we want to develop uh, people, and you spoke about you know, leadership development uh, that caters to, to everyone, is uh, having the leadership development programs based on aspirations and potential. So what are the aspirations and the potential of the person, regardless of their ethnicity or their or their gender? How can we support their growth in that space, regardless of that? And that can be achieved in many ways. But one of the most powerful ways is to create that coaching culture where, you know, maybe upskill managers to be as coaches to be able to have those two-way discussions with the employees to understand their aspirations, support in their uh, development, and look at them as uh, employees, regardless of any other thing. As as, as I said, without that unconscious bias that might um, impact the the decision-making in, uh, in that. So creating that coaching culture, upskilling the managers to be as coaches, having open discussions, connecting with the employees in a different way, that will foster that uh, development and inclusiveness. Very interesting. It was it was a very, very insightful conversation with you. Um, a, a big thank you to our incredible guest, uh, Nancy Zakaria, today for sharing our wealth of experience and wisdom on female advancement in the workplace. Nancy, your passion for empowering women and fostering inclusive leadership is is truly inspiring, a lot to take back today, today. And to our listeners, thank you for being a part of this important conversation. If you have more questions or thoughts, drop them in the comments. Stay tuned for more engaging discussions on the future of workplace. Until next time, This is Asta signing off from Work the Talk.